Can I just check that we are people are, are notified using the chat to say that they're going to um, speak? Yep. Fine. Okay, Chair, I can confirm we're now live. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so good good morning, uh, members, uh, officers, and any members of the public who are viewing this live stream of this meeting. Uh, welcome to this meeting, which is South Cambridgeshire District Council's Cabinet meeting. My name's Councillor Bridget Smith, and I'm the leader of this council, and I'm chair of the Cabinet as well. Uh, so for information on members of the pub public, the Cabinet, which is made up of myself and eight lead Cabinet members, who you should be able to see on screen with their names there, so I won't introduce them all in, in individually. Um, it's responsible for most of the Council services and for preparing a budget and for the Council's major policies and strategies, which are considered by full Council. Um, so if you could please, um, everybody participating in the meeting, make sure that your microphones are off until the point at which you are invited to speak. And if you'd like to indicate that you wish to speak or ask a question, please would you do so in the chat? And uh, between myself and uh, one of my deputies, Councillor Aidan van der Weyer, we'll keep a close, close eye on it and hopefully take everybody in the order in which they ask to speak. Uh, so we also have present um, Councillor Judith Ripith, who is the Vice Chair of the Scrutiny and Overview Committee. Um, would you just like to introduce yourself, please, Councillor Ripith? Good morning. I'm Councillor Judith Ripith of Milton and Waterbeach Ward and Vice Chair of Scrutiny. Thank, thank you very much indeed. And um, have we got, uh, I can see that we've got Councillor Deborah Roberts present who, uh, hello, hello Deborah, nice to see you. Have we any other other non-Cabinet members present please, if you'd just like to um, say hello? Um, yes, uh, Councillor Claire Daunton, um, one of the members for the Fendit and, and Fullbourne Ward. And Bridget, um, sorry Chair, Leader, um, Councillor Anna Bradnam, one of the members for Milton and Waterbeach Ward. Morning. And Chair, Thank sorry, uh, Sarah Tom Johnson, Longstanton Ward. Douglas Hello. DLC from uh, Girton Ward. Lovely. Very nice to see you, Douglas. Heather Williams, the Mordens Ward. And Richard Williams, Morning. Wood Ward. Sorry. That's lovely. Uh, That's lovely. It's difficult, isn't it? Pippa Halings from Histon and Bington and Orchard Park. That's, that's everyone, Bridget. That's lovely. That's very nice to see so many uh, non-Cabinet members giving up their uh, their Monday morning in order to participate in this. Uh, and we also have officers, um, a number of officers from our senior leadership team present, uh, including Liz Watts, our chief executive, and Anne Ainsworth, our chief operating officer. Um, and uh, they will uh, they will step in if uh, if the need arises or we ask them to uh, to contribute. Uh, so on announcements. Um, so it's uh, it's sad to say that this week sees the first anniversary of the the first lockdown um, due to COVID. It's uh, it's hard to believe that it's been it's been a whole year. Um, but I would just like to take this opportunity to say thank you most importantly to all our communities who've just done the most astounding job of keeping the show on the road for all of us um, for showing showing us how you know can the strength of communities and how they can they can pull together to really save people's lives i suppose the reality you know they've, they've fed people they've kept people connected they've made phone calls they've done a huge amount and uh, you know i'm immensely proud of every single one of our, our communities in south cambridgeshire um, but thank you also to the tremendous efforts of councillors within south cambridge district council and also to our officers um, i know that both officers and councillors have been tireless uh, over this last year and have stepped into many roles which aren't traditional roles um, that any of any of us do. So again, you know, feeding thousands of feeding thousands of people for whom you know food's been a problem 
Um, and again, just keeping keeping tens of thousands of people safe. Um, and just finally, uh, one of the good things about COVID is that it has really strengthened a lot of our partnerships. So uh, both Councillor Bill Handley and myself participate in weekly meetings with uh, the County Council, with all the other our neighbouring district councils, with public health, with the health service, education, fire, police and combined authority. And that's those that is a very, very significant partnership because we really all have been working together in the best interests of our communities. And I, I hope that those those strong partnerships and that strong partnership working will continue uh, long after COVID becomes uh, becomes a distant and unpleasant memory for, for most of us. Um, so that's one of the good things. So moving moving on. Um, to apologies for absence. Um, Jonathan, have we any apologies for absence, please? Good morning, Leader. We have not received any apologies for absence from Cabinet members, but we have received apologies from Grenville, uh, Councillor Grenville Chamberlain, the Chair of the Scrutiny and Overview Committee. Thank you. And I gather that Councillor Chamberlain is busy working with uh, the equivalent committee at the combined authority this morning. So um, so thank you very much to um, Councillor Rippers for standing in. Uh, do we have any declarations of interest pertaining to any of the items on today's agenda, please? Uh, from from me, uh, Leader, only for item 13, we make indirect reference to uh, investment return and I'm uh, representative on the investment partnership. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Macdonald. So if that could be noted, please, in the minutes. And moving on to the minutes of the previous meeting, which start at page one, and I will go through them page by page. Please uh, indicate if you have uh, any points you'd like to raise. So page one, page two, page three, page four, page five, page six, and they end on page seven. No, OK, thank you. So members are asked to pr approve the minutes of the meeting held on the 3rd of February. Um, I move, move the approval of those minutes as a correct record. Uh, do I have a seconder for that, Councillor van der Weyer? Are you seconding these? Uh, uh, yes, that's right, yes. Thank you, thank you very much indeed. So do members agree to approve the, the minutes? Agreed. 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 Does anyone wish to vote against the proposal? And does anyone wish to abstain? OK, thank you. So Cabinet therefore agrees the approval of the minutes as a correct record by affirmation. So moving on to item five of public questions. And um, I'm very pleased that we have uh, two members of the public who have also given up their Monday mornings to come and talk to us. Uh, so firstly, we have a question from Mrs Jane Williams. Uh, Mrs Williams, are you present? Uh, I'm here. Can you hear me all right? I am. Would you like to uh, pose your question, please? And I, oh, yeah. um, uh, the question's being taken by Councillor Toomey Hawkins. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, it's rather a long question. Um, in 2016, the Council granted planning permission for the development of Cambridge North Station at Cheston Sidings. As part of that planning permission, approximately 1.6 hectares of land was designated for ecological migration measures, including the retention of existing trees and vegetation, the creation of a new area of wetland habitat and the installation of new habitat areas for invertebrates. The site, which forms an important connector between the Bramblefields local nature reserve and nearby habitat areas, was deemed to be an area of near SSA quality and was in particular noted for its potential as a rich habitat for invertebrates and reptiles. When the Council released its draft Northeast Cambridge Area Action Plan last year, this 1.6 hectare ecological site was inexplicably not included on the spatial framework maps and the land was instead relocated to provide for more profitable town centre, retail and housing uses. In the past several months, the entire site was clear cut of all trees and vegetation in violation of the 2016 Planning Commission. In its recently adopted Dublin Nature Strategy, the Council says that it will make the most of our direct influence on the natural environments as the local planning authority. But in this case, Greater Cambridge Planning has ignored its own designation of 1.6 hectares of land for ecological mitigation. 
In the light of the ecological devastation we have seen associated with council approved developments at Cambridge North and other sites, including North Stowe, how can the public have any confidence that the council actually cares about Dublin nature and what measures will be taken to remediate this? Thank you. Sorry, Monday morning. Uh, thank you very much indeed, uh, Mrs Williams. Uh, Councillor Hawkins, would you like to respond? Uh, thank you, Leader. Uh, yes, good morning, Mrs Williams, and uh, thank you for your question. Um, firstly, I would like to reiterate um, that this council does care about Dublin nature, and we are taking steps uh, to do this. Um, secondly, in respect to the specific matter you referred to, uh, the land near the Cambridge North Station where trees have recently been cleared. The 2016 um, planning permission and the condition which you identified actually was not implemented. Instead, subsequent applications were submitted to and approved by uh, South Cams as well as Cambridge City. And the land that has been cleared was included in these subsequent permissions which were implemented and uh, they did have a condition that required a submission of a landscape and ecological management plan. Now that plan was submitted at the time and assessed by the city council's ecologists who found it acceptable but that plan did not show landscape or ecological features to be retained within the area uh, where the recent works have been carried out. So as there was no requirement through those subsequent permissions which were implemented to retain the vegetation, unfortunately there is no breach of condition and so there is no enforcement action that we can take. And just to let you know that removing trees and vegetation from land does not require planning permission unless there is a TPO involved. Um, therefore in this case you know, the council had no control over those works. Um, but thirdly, and hopefully uh, to give you and the public the assurance that we are committed to our aim of increasing biodiversity and doubling nature in the district, as part of the work on the North East Cambridge Area Action Plan, the council had actually already undertaken a biodiversity assessment back in June of 2020 of the area. And this will be used as a baseline for any future applications in the area where we expect proposals from developers to meet the national planning policy framework requirement for a net gain and also be for our own emerging, emerging <coughs> policy objectives. Thank for the area action plan also provides significant opportunities for delivering our biodiversity objectives uh, through a wide range of new, both formal and informal spaces across the site, and also maintaining uh, the habitat that does exist as those sites come forward. So we are demonstrating our firm commitment to Dublin nature through <coughs> some of the planning decisions we've made recently across the district and through our emerging policies. So I hope that you and our residents will recognise that commitment as those new concerted permissions are built out. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Hawkins. Um, Mrs Williams, would you like uh, to come back with a supplementary question? Um, yes, please. Um, thank you, um, Councillor Hawkins. Um, yes, it is incredibly admirable. I obviously follow a lot that's going on with the Dublin Nature um, strategy, which I have actually read. One of the issues that I have and would like assurance with is um, the fact that we have these plans, um, and I've studied lots of them, as you probably know, I, I live in Water Beach. Um, for me, we have all these plans, we have all these aspirations as to how we want to, and, and visions to bring things forward. What concerns me is when, after planning has been approved, how it actually translates on the ground, such as the parameter plans, such as land profiling, such as ensuring that we are doubling nature, that we're dealing with contamination. Um, I believe that you're doing some work with enforcement at the moment to try and bring these things forward. But when you have these huge sites coming forward, I have no um, 
I would like to have the reassurance, but I'm not quite sure how I feel whether what is being approved is being tra translated in a right manner. So, you know, sort of what checks and balances um, rather than what is being proposed, what is actually being done to ensure that these, especially the huge sites are coming forward because of the implications on nature, um, the landscape and everything else, which I'm sure you're aware of. So I would like to sort of know how you would how it's being dealt with, really. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Willi Ms. Williams. That's, that's quite a big question, actually. Uh, Councillor Hawkins, do you want to add anything at this point? Um, just to say, I do recognise the concern that Mrs. Williams um, has uh, expressed. Uh, one of the things that we did um, with the new reorganisation of this service was to introduce what we call the strategic sites team. And we are uh, working within that team um, to to make sure that when we do grant permissions and you know and conditions come forward for discharges that we actually you know um, look at this uh, in quite a lot of detail. Mm. Um, I mean, I, I would be willing to have a chat with you, um, you know, outside of this, um, just to give you a bit more detail, um, you know, where possible as to, um, you know, some of the things that we 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 are doing. But please be assured that. Um, the fact that we now have our Dublin Nature um, uh, strategy means that we will be looking at all these sites, that the big sites especially, that come forward uh, in closer detail. Um, unlike in this case where the permission was given, you know, several years ago, which we have not, you know, we cannot do anything about that. The new permissions that we are giving, we are making sure that, um, you know, as best as we can, what is built is what was um, permissioned. Thank you very much, um, Councillor Hawkins. And I think the important point uh, Councillor Hawkins makes is that we really are very keen to work as closely as possible with our communities. So it's not about us dictating that stuff is done to them. It's about us working together to deliver actually what communities want, as well as uh, you know what, what should be um, provided as a result of planning permissions. So I hope that gives you um, reassurance, Mrs Williams, and uh, please do email Councillor Hawkins if you would like to uh, just have an informal chat about this. Uh, now, so moving on, uh, second question is from Mr Daniel Fulton. Are you present, Mr Fulton? Uh, yes, I am. Thank you, Chair. Hello, you're quite a regular these days, <laughs> so please put, please put your question. In September of last year, the Council's Planning for Performance Submission uh, for Q2 2020 told the government that 85% of non-major planning applications had been determined within the time allowed. However, an audit conducted by the Fuse Lane Consortium found that the truthful figure was only 9%. At the cabinet meeting in January, the portfolio holder for planning agreed that the council's internal audit team would review and report on its findings in regards to the Q2 2020 data for non-major applications. It has now been more than two months later and neither the promised either the promised audit has not been conducted or the council is suppressing the results of the audit. There is a local election scheduled for May 6. And it certainly appears that the council is more concerned about protecting the political future. Uh, uh, Mr. Fulton, could, you keep, could you keep to the subject matter of your, your submitted question? Please? I, am. I don't want us to deviate into, that's, into that's politics fine. on this. Thank case. you, Chair. Uh, it seems uh, that the council is more concerned uh, about uh, protecting reputations uh, than about correcting the dishonest planning performance statements uh, made by the council to the government, to members of the council and to the public. The gap between the actual performance figure of 9% and the council's claimed performance of 85% is staggering. Even if you give the council the benefit of the doubt in every single case, and even if the council has misinterpreted every rule in every possible instance, the council's performance figure wouldn't have even reached 40%. The only plausible explanation for the council's reported figure of 85% is intentional dishonesty. Could the portfolio holder for planning please explain why the internal audit report uh, has not been completed as she had instructed? Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fulton. Uh, Councillor Hawkins. Uh, good morning, Mr. Fulton. Uh, thank you for your question. As you may appreciate, the council audit team has a work schedule. Um, so when additional work is required, 
it is fitted into their work stream as quickly as is uh, possible. The Council's internal audit team began the audit of the uh, Q2 2020 PS2 submission in February of 2021. And I am advised by the lead audit officer that the team uh, is working on it and we expect to be in a position to report their findings to the scrutiny meeting on the 20th of April 2021. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Councillor Hawkins. So obviously, you know, these things take time. They can't be done overnight. Uh, Mr Fulton, do you have a, a follow up question which relates directly to your original question, please? Uh, yes, I do. Um, I do appreciate that reviewing the audit submission will involve um, the review of over 3000 individual documents um, associated with over 300 planning applications. And I realize that this takes time. Um, however, it took a, a team of relatively untrained of th a team of three relatively inexperienced volunteers uh, approximately two days uh, to to complete our audit. So um, I appreciate that the audit team is busy and has many responsibilities, um, but but I do think that this needs to be uh, taken taken forward as quickly as possible. Thank you for your response, Councillor Hopkins. Uh, I appreciate it very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fulton. So I don't think there was a there was a question there, but uh, other, uh, you know, the, the the key issue is that we if we do these things, we have to do them very, very thoroughly and doing things really thoroughly and accurately takes takes time. Uh, so thank you very much, Mr. Fulton. All right, so I think um, our visitors uh, will be leaving the main body of the meeting now and we shall move on now to item six, uh, which is issues arising from the scrutiny and overview committee. And I see from your report you've been the, this committee has been doing some really very good work on some very big, big issues, um, and I'm very grateful for that. It's, they're being very focused, which is great. Um, so, Councillor Ripper, do you want to um, speak on the report, uh, or do you want to speak in the body of the meeting, or a bit of, bit of both? Uh, could you unmute yourself, please, Councillor Ripper? Yes, yeah, sure. Can I speak on the report now, please? Yes, please do. Um, just to say it's very well written um, up by Victoria, as usual. Um, the housing repairs um, point on page 10 um, really want to emphasise the timely and responsive service that I'm sure um, you as a cabinet will be looking at as well. And then moving on to the task and finish groups, um, both of which have carried out a lot of detailed work and I was part of the COVID-19 one and just want to emphasise it was an, an honour to be part of that group and to recognise how much hard work has been put in by local members, officers and community groups and it was the working together that I think really made the difference. Um, just one thing to add, um, a lot of churches also helped out um, with meal delivery and the Christmas meal scheme, just that that wasn't mentioned in the snapshot. Um, I think that really covers most of it. And there's nine um, points to take forward from the race anti-racism um, task and finish group too. So lots of good work um, carrying on. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Ripples, and thank you for pointing out my omission, uh, which I really shouldn't have made because actually I've been in conversations with the Gamla Gay Baptist Church this weekend who are, have got a fantastic plan for sort of continuing the work that they've been doing all along. And actually in the first lockdown, they delivered food to me as well, which was uh, was marvellous. So, of course, you know, of course, we acknowledge uh, all the work of the church of the churches um, of, of all of all faiths. Yeah, it's uh, so quite hard to remember everything because there's so much going on. Okay. It is. We do we do our best. Thank you very much indeed. OK, so uh, Councillor De Lacey would like to uh, like to speak on this uh, this issue, this matter. Thank you very much, Leader, it's specifically on ICT. And I'm sorry that I couldn't have brought this uh, to the Scrutiny and Overview uh, Committee itself. But on Friday, I reported a problem with our planning website. And I had rather worrying responses from planning officers, which suggested an, an amount of uncertainty as to who is responsible for IDOCS, the planning software we use. 
is it the Greater Cambridge Planning Service or is it 3C? And I hope that uh, we will actually look at this in the future because it seems to me this is potentially quite a big problem. Uh, I should say that as of 9.45 this morning, the problem remains unresolved, which also raises the question of how parishes are kept informed about these issues and how they can obtain planning extensions if they cannot properly prepare a response. Thank you, Leader. Thank you very much indeed. Um, does any cabinet member want to respond on that? Uh, Councillor Milnes. Yes, thank you, Leader. Um, all, all I can uh, offer at the moment is a, a confirmation that the, the planning service had a problem over the weekend uh, and at the end of last week. I was waiting for a report from Jeff Membry and Dan Ainsworth as to uh, the nature of that. Um, I think uh, it continues uh, to be an area of concern because the um, reliability and robustness of the site is clearly uh, lacking and, and that continues. So um, I'd, I'd just like to acknowledge uh, Councillor De Lacey's uh, recording of the, the continuing issue. And I think his, the, his question about who's responsible uh, in terms of reporting and so on about whether it's the planning service or ICT as the shared service um, is, a, is a, a salient question. Thank you very much. I'm going to bring in um, Jeff Membry. Um, just uh, an update on that leader. I'm waiting for full details of what the problem is, but we are running constant monitoring now of the uh, the council's planning website and we should have received notification when it went down. Now we didn't receive that, so I'm trying to find out exactly why. And as soon as I find out, I'll, I'll report to uh, Councillor Milne and the rest of Cabinet. That, that's that's super. Thank you very much. And thank you very much, Councillor De Lacey, for, uh, for raising, raising that. Uh, so, you, Chairman, can, uh, yes, Leader, can I just say um, I'm slightly surprised if this was known on Friday generally uh, that parishes weren't uh, made aware of it. I was told, I think, by Stephen that a message would be put on the front page of the planning website, but I suspect very, very few people ever go to the front page of the planning website. They will go to the um, uh, the planning request form. So I wonder if we could make sure that parishes are immediately made aware if we know that there are problems. Thank you. I think that's a point very well made and we shall take that back. Thank you very much indeed. All right. So if nobody else wants to comment on this um, in relation to item six, members are asked to note the report from Scrutiny and Overview Committee. So moving on to item seven, uh, which is on page um, 11. Uh, so just to show Scrutiny and Overview Committee have been working extremely hard. Uh, this is the report from their anti-racism task and finish group. And uh, there are nine recommendations here. And Councillor Chung, Chung Johnson, who chaired this task and finish group, is going to present this to us. So are you are you ready to go? Hello, Chair. Um, I'm not going to read the report. I'm just uh, conscious that everyone is busy. Um, and I think Victoria has done a fabulous job of writing this up um, and that it is pretty clear. I think overwhelmingly uh, on behalf of the group, we feel that this has to be an ongoing piece of work and not finite. Uh, and obviously it impacts pretty much every area of the council, which is where we why we came up with the recommendation that it needs to have uh, a cabinet focus. We were also incredibly impressed um, with the work the city have already done with many of the items that were in our motion originally, um, and which is also why we've recommended pairing up with them, because obviously our communities do cross over. Um, for my own community, for example, in Chinese Community Centre is, is a huge community in, in Cambridge, and those of us who live in South Cambridge will always travel into the city to, to meet up uh, with fellow um, community members. So obviously a lot of our residents were already mingling and so therefore our work should be uh, put together. Um, so uh, I'll leave it there. I would like to obviously thank um, the officers that have given a lot of time for the group and also my fellow task force group members as well. If there's any questions, just let me know. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Yes. So so my my thanks to uh, both yourself, uh, Councillor Daunton, Councillor Harvey and Councillor Williams. Uh, who I think you must all have put in a considerable amount of work into this. 
Um, but thank you also for acknowledging uh, the invaluable support of uh, Susan Gardner-Craig, uh, our head of HR, and uh, Victoria Wallace, who supports the work of the Scrutiny of o Overview Committee. Uh, so I think this, this is going to be proposed by Councillor John Williams and seconded by Councillor Aidan van der Weyer. So if I can hand over to John. Uh, thank you, Leader. Um, I'm proposing the recommendations set out in paragraph three as lead cabinet member for staffing, given that we must work with our staff to achieve uh, the results. Can I first thank the work of Councillor John Jun Johnston and members of her task and fringe group on producing this excellent report and its recommendations? And can I also thank the officers who gave such positive support to the working group, including colleagues at the City Council? These recommendations arise from the motion passed by full council at its meeting on the 16th of July. And as you can see from paragraph 11, uh, some of the recommendations will require additional funding. And wearing my finance hat, I will ensure that we follow through these recommendations in the coming financial year. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Councillor van der Weyer, do you want to speak now? Uh, yes, I'll just say that this is a fantastic piece of work and uh, re really, really puts some really careful thought into this um, from, from all, all of the members involved in this. And um, uh, there's some sort of re really stimulating things that, that we need to, that the council as a whole uh, needs to take away and do. And, and I think that will result in some, some really significant improvements um, uh, to, to how we, we um, uh, act and how we engage with, with um, communities, uh, the, the diverse communities that we have in South Camps. It's fantastic. Thank you very much. Are there any other members of Cabinet who'd like to speak? No, uh, so I've got Councillor Anna Bradlam. Thank you, Leader. Um, I just wanted to point out that in um, this report at IT recommendation uh, seven, there's a provision, a, a recommendation for provision of training on Gypsy, Roma and Traveller cultural awareness to all councillors and officers. And I just wanted to point out that through the work that the community, the South Cambridgeshire Community Safety Partnership is doing, um, which is re which is um, dealing with community res a res delivery of a community resilience toolkit, um, actually, as part of that, not only the members concerned, but also members of the parish council are taking part in the cultural awareness training to do with Gypsy Roma and Traveller communities. So this is already being rolled out and it's being rolled out in 10 um, workshops uh, which are being held with parish council members. So you might want to take that into account in the recognition that this work is already ongoing. Thank, thank you very, thank you very much indeed, um, Councillor Hawkins. Uh, thank you, Chair. Sorry, I, I missed the um, earlier slot. <laughs> Type in and um, trying to unmute. Um, just wanted to add my thanks to the task and finish group. Really, um, as um, you know, one of the members of the you know minority ethnic groups in the council, um, it is good to see how. Uh, how much progress we have made from, um, you know, when we passed the motion uh, to now and the proposals being made. Um, you know, a lot of work has gone into it and I'm hoping that um, we'll see even more progress in the future as we um, implement some of this. Um, I'm not sure I might have, I might not have but seen this in the report, but what I'm hoping is that there will be um, training available uh, for unconscious bias um, across the uh, across the council and potentially made available to um, other organizations who you know who we work with because I think this is a very important part of actually ensuring that um, you know we are inclusive <laughs> in what we do. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, could everybody make sure they're muted please because we've got some interesting thumping going on in the background. Thank you. Uh, thank you Councillor Hawkins. So um, you know with things these are these are re these are ambitious recommendations and we're going to have to put we're going to have to put work into them but we will we will absolutely put work into this it's just it's so important uh that we do this we do this po properly and that south cambridgeshire as a district and but our district council as well is a a great place for everybody to uh, to work and to participate in so you know huge congratulations on the ambition of this 
And uh, I take your point, Councillor John Johnson, that this isn't a one off. This isn't something that you just rubber stamp and then file away to gather dust. This is work that has to be consist constantly reviewed and probably amended. And, you know, if some things are are not working out well, we might have to think different differently about how to how to deal with it. But, uh, you know, I know that um, you you in particular will be keeping a very close eye on this and uh, holding our holding our feet to the fire on it. So thank you very much indeed. Uh, so members are asked to approve the nine recommendations. Um, so uh, if I can come to members, um, are you all minded to approve all nine recommendations in this report, please? Agreed. 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 Uh, anybody wish to abstain? And anybody, sorry, anybody wish to vote against? Thank you very much. So the uh, recommendations are, are approved by Cabinet. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, so moving on to uh, yet another bit of excellent work from the Scrutiny Overview Committee. And um, this is their COVID-19 response task and finish group. And Councillor Bill Handley, I believe, is going to present this. And um, I should be really pleased to, uh, to second it. So over to you, Councillor Handley. Thank you, Leader. Uh, in your uh, introduction, you you um, mentioned the tremendous community response we've seen across the district, and um, I'd like to echo my that with my give my praise also for this. Um, the task and finish group was set up by the scrutiny and overview committee to look at lessons learned, and um, they've held discussions with volunteers. Um, and those meetings were attended by myself and officers from the communities team. Um, the pros, proposals in this paper are to ensure that there's sufficient resource for community recovery and for the council to host an event or events to celebrate the positive aspect of the, the pandemic when, when we can safely do so. Um, I'm really pleased to say that we've already made significant progress on this and indeed later this week um, we officers um, and myself are, are going to be speaking again with volunteers how we can move this forward. The recommendations are given on page 19 and I'm very pleased to put them to Cabinet. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Councillor Handley. Um, so my my personal thanks to uh, Councillor Chamberlain, Councillor Daunton, Councillor Hales, Councillor Ripperth, and also to you, Councillor Handley, um, and to all your supporting officers for this, this work. Um, I'm delighted that uh, one of your recommendations is that um, we should have events to celebrate because my goodness we all need a few parties to look forward to uh, because there haven't been there haven't been too many of them for the last last year so you know both both members and all our our, our fabulous volunteers um, could certainly do with something something in their diary as soon as as soon as it's safe to put it in there uh, and something jolly and I hope I hope that we will do people proud actually and we will do something that's memorable uh, to say thank you, because I think what this acknowledges is that the work isn't going to stop. And certainly some of the stuff that uh, in the media from public health yesterday about a lot of these measures are likely to stay in place for, for years shows that we're just not we're not going to get to the point where suddenly we we switch back into the way the way life was. Um, but there there have been lots of positives uh, for from the the way that COVID has brought communities together, which actually we need moving forward, even even when COVID isn't around anymore, because actually our, our communities are better places for a lot of this work that's been going on. Um, so I'm very grateful to uh, the, the Scrutiny and Overview Committee for uh, highlighting this as a priority, and I'm delighted to be able to uh, support both of, both of their recommendations. Uh, so would anybody from Cabinet like to speak on this? No. And would any other members present like to speak? No. OK, so in which case I'll move straight to, uh, to the recommendations and ask, uh, do members uh, agree to approve these recommendations? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. Does anyone wish to vote against? And does anyone wish to abstain? 
Okay, so Cabinet therefore agrees the recommendations um, and thank you again to, uh, to all participants. And moving on to um, item nine, which is actions taken under the Chief Executive's delegated powers. And I think these pertain to, uh, to some grants back in the, uh, the days when we were in tier four, which seems like a lifetime ago. So uh, anybody got any questions on, the, on this item? No. OK, so member, uh, hang on. so we're just asked to, uh, to note the report. And moving swiftly on to item 10, uh, which is the um, quarter three performance report. And Councillor Neil Goff is going to present this and I would like to second it. So uh, Councillor Neil Goff, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Leader. Um, so there's, there's basically uh, two appendices for this um, report, one of which uh, looks at the KPIs, which are sort of performance against sort of business as usual. And secondly, Appendix B, which looks at uh, performance against our business plan objectives for uh, 2021 um, and the, the things over and above business as usual. Um, this period covers a uh, third quarter, which is October to November, uh, October to December. So obviously we have the continued impact of COVID and uh, the back end, the second national um, lockdown to contend with. Um, if I just briefly look at Appendix A, um, first of all, and then I'm going to focus most of my comments on Appendix B, which is a which is a sort of new structure of a report, which I think is um, particularly helpful for, for members. Um, in terms of Appendix A, we see continu continuing sort of trends in quarter from in quarter three from the previous quarters. Um, there are <coughs> a number of areas of red. Um, some of those are relating to the particular impact of COVID. Um, I think what we've tried to do in this report is provide extensive commentary uh, on areas where that has occurred. Um, in the notes, and I'm sure if any questions, we'll come back to um, review those with uh, input from the respective cabinet members. But I want to focus most of my comments on Appendix B, which we've we've sort of restructured, and I hope is um, welcome for members. This basically looks at our performance relative to um, some of the particular targets we had, and again, given the uh, impact of, of COVID. I think this is highlights a number of areas where we've done frankly remarkably well. Um, and I just want to go over a number of them which as of third quarter were either achieved or uh, looking as though they were well on the way to being achieved. So first is the, the actual um, installation of the business support team, uh, which is obviously fully in place. And in many ways, thank goodness that they were, given the, the workload which the council has faced um, in terms of grants activity and support and the importance of that work. Uh, the existence of that team has been core to the ability of this council to support uh, those businesses. We've also seen um, over performance with respect to the number of new council homes completed, um, 66. Um, relative to a target of 50, which is um, a, a clear overperformance. We've also seen the establishment of all of the uh, liaison forum group meetings, which we set out to do. New ones have been established as targeted and have already started their work. Continued work on climate, um, seen the zero carbon strategy adopted, um, doubling nature strategy, Progress on the LED lighting, a project which had been stalled for many, many, many years, um, is now well underway and uh, on course to completion. Mm -hmm. Service reviews now started, um, completed in revenues and benefits and going on to planning. Progress on the investment strategy, uh, well on the way to the 25% income target being met. Online accounts for um, Council online and in sort of channel shift, 
now more than 22,000 accounts actually established. And mobile warden schemes uh, target exceeded there. We've now set up seven rather than three what we've what we've had. So I think even at the end of quarter three, if you look back and consider the uh, difficulties under which the offices were operating in 2021, that's really quite, quite stunning performance and uh, congratulations to all of those uh, involved. I'll just leave my comments at that and um, happy to pick up any questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Councillor, Councillor Goff. So I think it's nothing short of a miracle, actually, that we have um, kept the show on the road so effectively in the last last year and business as usual has continued and it's continued really, really well, despite everything that's been thrown at us. Uh, so I think I do think I think it's miraculous and, uh, you know, huge credit to all our officers for being so adaptive, but also so hardworking that, uh, you know, they've managed to uh, to keep the organisation functioning so so efficiently. Um, similar to Councillor Goff, I'm very pleased with the, the changes in the way this report's been presented. And my thanks to Kevin Ledger, uh, Phil Bird and to Jeff Membry for that. Um, poor Kevin really had us at the 11th hour saying, oh, rag rating would be a tremendously good idea. And uh, yeah, I think turned it turned it round in, in 24 hours, really. So thank you. And I certainly I like rag ratings. Uh, particularly with the amount of paperwork we all have to uh, have to deal with these days because it focuses the attention. So I think that's great. And I very much like the way uh, that the narrative goes. It's plain English and uh, you know will hopefully be of interest and comprehensible to members of the public, as well as uh, those of us who find ourselves too, too immersed in council speak. So, you know, congratulations. Everyone's done really, really well. And that uh, this this report reflects that success. So are there, is there any comments from anyone in Cabinet? No, OK, Councillor De Lacey would like to speak about on this one. Thank you very much, Leader. Um, I want particularly to talk about uh, pages 45 and 46, uh, the call centre results. Uh, you will know that I've been asking for more detail and I'm very grateful to Mr Membry who gave me November's full figures and with your indulgence, I would like to comment on them to explain why I'm asking for what I'm asking for generally. Uh, the standard deviation is 5.4 minutes, which is interestingly small, I think. In November, our record was 85.75% answered. Um, that's uh, you get from um, the, the, the figures that are presented. So I make that about 13,000 calls in total. Uh, in November since 1,862 were abandoned. But interesting figures, I think. Seven calls ended within less than one second. 57 uh, calls were ended within five seconds and 189 within 30 seconds. Is it reasonable to count those as part of the data set? Um, clearly, they weren't terribly serious. But at the other end, 62 callers hung over for over 20 minutes and seven callers between 30 and 40 minutes. And those, I think, are very significant figures. Our target for answering the call is 100 seconds and intervention is triggered at 180 seconds. 500 calls were abandoned before 100 seconds. Over 1000 callers hung on for over the 180 seconds. And it seems to me that gives us a lot more useful information than just a graph and an orange bar. And so I'm very grateful that Mr. Membry is now uh, making sure that the next software we use will actually um, provide something more of these figures. Um, as a PS, I wonder why incidentally each area needs to start a new page. It seems to waste an awful lot of paper in our printed agendas. Thank you very much, Lida. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Well, I'm working on a screen, so I haven't got anything printed, um, but I, I take your comment and I, sh I share your concerns. Councillor Goff, do you want to respond to uh, the specifics in um, Councillor De Lacey's comments? Um, I, I sort of will um, just say that actually, you know, looking at the distribution is obviously helpful, I think. Uh, uh, 
we 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 were very fortunate um, that Jeff uh, Membry has taken up uh, Councillor De Lacey's challenge, and I'm delighted that before uh, Councillor De Lacey steps down, we were actually uh, able to provide him with the data. So um, it, it is one of the things which the new system will actually help us with because um, it's it's. It's basically about understanding the way in which calls are actually received, calls are uh, are actually diverted, and calls are actually addressed. And and, and Councillor De Lacey sort of highlighted what I think is a, an important sort of element of this is that you do need to understand at a level of granularity that you you can appreciate what's going on, um, and that you can actually track uh, individual calls, and you can think about what the processes are which is sort of leading to people either getting a satisfactory service or an unsatisfactory service um, so i think it is a, a, a really important step um, and i think the new telephony system will actually help us do something about it rather than just monitoring the data but i just would like to ask whether uh, councillor um, whether uh, jeff membry would like to actually add any additional comments to that because he's uh, dealing with the actual new system itself. Uh, thank you, Jeff. Would you like to step in? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Leader. Yeah, um, uh, Councillor Goff is, uh, is absolutely right that we're focusing very much on making sure that not only can we get the sort of information we need from the new system to analyse exactly what's happened with calls, to be, to be able to identify potential uh, peak uh, peaks coming up in the future so we can ensure that we've got resources in place but also to ensure that we've got real-time information so that the people managing the uh, the call centre can see immediately if calls are starting to build up and can make some changes perhaps diverting people to, to different lines or or changing people's break times to ensure that we've got uh, people on hand to um, to try and make sure that we deliver our promises to respond to customers within a good time um, that's certainly very much uh, our focus we had an initial um, uh, session for potential bidders on the new system just um, just uh, last week so we're expecting to see some significant progress on that in the next few weeks thank you Jeff have we seen I, I can't tell from the graphs have we seen an increase in um, people uh, ringing up the contact center um, over the last 12 months we, we, we have uh, patches where we have significant increases um, what, we, what we found in particular towards the end of 2020 was uh, of course uh, near the beginning of 2020 there wasn't uh, a recovery action for council tax or business rates and those of course started towards the end of um, uh, 2020 so we saw a significant increase when, once those started to go out and yes as we move into to lockdown and there was extra grants for businesses we had a significant increase increasing calls for businesses and eventually the call centre had to support the business support team there to, to enable them to get on with processing the, the grants so the, the call centre had to take some of those calls so yeah we have seen quite a significant increase. Well, that's interesting and uh, uh, Councillor Goff do you want to come back in, back on that? Yeah I actually just made the point I was going to make about um, you know the, the the number of business calls uh, relating to sort of grants and other uh, support which we've taken um, but again, that's the other thing, the sort of thing you need to understand when you look at this, uh, this data is um, you know, what do you do with those peaks and how you kind of deal with those peaks without address, without um, uh, adversely affecting the service levels for regular calls. Um, and I think, again, that's something which the, the new system will hopefully help us with in terms of being able to um, sort of more directly target and direct those uh, those sort of peak calls. Thank, thank you very much. Um, Councillor Heather Williams, you've got a question. Thank you, Leader. Apologies if um, I repeat anything that's been said previously. My I completely dropped out. The internet all crashed and went down. So um, if I'm making repetition, my apologies. Um, it was just about page 39 on um, the housing and property services the average days to relet all housing stock. Now, I appreciate that there is going to be disruption because of COVID, but I was just wondering when then factored in the amount that's fed on bed and breakfast and everything else, is there any way we can try and speed up this process or, or what's happening? Because obviously we want people in, in their homes, you know, 
as soon as possible, really. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. And I think COVID has had a catastrophic um, effect on uh, on reletting stock. Um, but if I could bring, I don't know if Hazel, do you want to help Hazel Smith? You come in first and then we might bring in uh, Peter Campbell as well for some more detail. Yes, ju just to say that um, there have been particular problems. Of course, the days to relet are only logged at the end. So, you know, any problems with COVID will will sort of um, mount up because um, the, the difficult ones will be logged at the point where they have been let. Um, and the um, there have been problems, particularly with with Mears um, actually uh, giving us the amount of um, service that we need. And so we have also been going out to other contractors um, with with the agreement of Mears to to, um, to help them out. Um, I don't know whether Pete's got Peter's got anything else to add to that. Thank you, Peter Campbell. Yes, thank you. There's two things that I'd, I'd like to mention. First of all, about the, the real it's themselves. There are two reasons, reasons why the uh, the properties have been taken longer. Uh, the first is the one that Hazel's covered is the fact that we've not had the uh, the contractors haven't been able to carry out work uh, as quickly as we would have liked, and that's partly to do with COVID. But the second point is also to do with the choice of of potential tenants. People have not wanted to move uh, uh, during the, uh, the, the the pandemic, uh, especially older people and people who, who are more vulnerable. So, you know, with people not wanting to move, of course, that has a, a, um, a knock on effect uh, uh, on the void figures. The other thing that Councillor Williams mentions, though, in passing, was the increase in bed and breakfast. Uh, and although in normal times we'd be aiming to uh, reduce bed and bre uh, breakfast expenditure, it's particularly high this time because of the good work that the service have done uh, in uh, uh, responding to the government's um, uh, request to, to ensure that everybody who's homeless is housed even in temporary accommodation. So the, the, there is a, an increase in use of bed and breakfast, breakfast purely because we, we, we put the extra effort in, in, in response to the, uh, uh, response to the, the, the government work. Uh, and what's not reflected in these figures is that the increase in bed and breakfast for that purpose was met with an increase in funding for, for, from government. Uh, and perhaps it would be useful if we, we spent some time to try and split out the, the underlying trend for bed and breakfast uh, and the COVID trend, uh, which has provided the bump in these figures. Thank, thank you very much. So, so it's unusual that, you know, actually we are we're celebrating uh, the fact that this amount of money spent on bed and breakfast is in the red because it shows that we've done a really, really excellent job um, in identifying people who are homeless and actually getting them all a, a decent roof over their heads. So, you know, congratulations to the enormous efforts that our homelessness team have put, put in there because I know it's been really, really tough. And of course, things are likely to get tougher because, uh, you know, at the moment um, there's a halt on evictions you know, once once that halt is lifted, uh, my expectation is certainly we're going to see you know a whole load more people um, suddenly suddenly homeless, and so you know that figure is going to uh, is going to increase even more. But uh, you know, I'm really you know we're pleased that the government has provided us with the money to meet meet the need. You know, whether they continue to to meet the need as as we come out of lockdown is, a, is another matter because the problem is certainly not going to go away, certainly not going to get better and it's definitely going to uh, going to get worse. Um, so uh, Councillor Williams, you'd like to come back? Yes, please, because I think I think my uh, question was slightly misunderstood. Um, what I was referring to was the bed and breakfast figures and the the re, um, the figures to do with the housing stock whether there was capacity to take people out of the bed and breakfast and put them in to the houses that we're not letting out at present. That was my question, whether if we increase the turnaround to be able to let the properties out, could those people come out of bed and breakfast and go into proper um, housing? That was my question. It wasn't a criticism of the figures being spent, um, which I feel is how it's been interpreted but that was not it at all. As as you you know, as you've made aware, it's it's government funding, it's and policy, and 
which I'm very supportive of. But I was looking at way maybe we could use that as a more long term solution. You know, emergency accommodation, bed and breakfast are great, but it'd be much better if we can get people in in their in a house they can call their own. Absolutely. I'm going to bring Peter, uh, Peter Campbell back in, but you know, oh, that we had enough empty houses that we could house all the people who are currently in bed and breakfast, I think is my review. But uh, Peter, would you like to come back in on that? Yes, sorry if I slightly misunderstood the original question. Um, yes, uh, that's what we've tried to do, Councillor, is that um, uh, when we were, were struggling with the, uh, with, with the relays, we asked the contractor to prioritise family accommodation. Uh, which would take you know, families out of, of bed and breakfast uh, more quickly, recognising that they're the least suitable people to be in bed and breakfast. Uh, the, the majority of people left in bed and breakfast now are single people, uh, and that's where we have a, a real accommodation shortage. But we, 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 we'll, we'll be looking at that over the uh, yeah, coming months. Uh, thank you very much. And I'm sure, um, Councillor Williams, that uh, Peter Campbell will give you further detail if uh, if you wish that. Um, are there any more questions on this item? No? OK, so Cabinet's recommended to review the KPI results and comments at Appendix A and progress against business plan actions at Appendix B, recommending where appropriate any actions required to address any issues identified. So do members agree with the proposal? Agreed. Really good. Really good. Does, does anyone wish to vote against? And does anyone wish to abstain? OK, so Cabinet therefore agrees with the proposal by affirmation. Thank you very much. And moving on to item 11, which is at page 59. And this is the review of the, uh, the forthcoming business plan. And Councillor Neil Goff is going to um, present this and Councillor Aidan van der Weyer is going to second it. So um, over to you, Councillor Goff again. OK, thank you, Leader. Um, for, first of all, I'd like to sort of just thank uh, Anne Ainsworth and the officers for preparing this um, this report as well, and the work which has gone into it. Um, this is in a familiar format, um, which is reflective of the continuity in our in our business planning, um, which uh, we have tried to um, uh, establish um, uh, over the last couple of years. So it's in the same format, the same four priorities uh, and uh, lists again the particular areas of focus for 21-22 um, in terms of delivery in the business plan to go alongside the, the, uh, the budget uh, which has been approved. Um, I would like to just recognise that while there is obviously a lot of continuity in the focus of our business plans. Uh, we do need to recognise that this has been an extraordinary year and there are sort of lasting implications and impact on our activities. So um, this business plan contains uh, uh, an enhanced um, a focus on business support and on business recovery from COVID as part of its actions and it also um, considers um, the impact on uh, communities and we've already talked about the importance of communities in this area and uh, highlights continued focus in terms of rebuilding um, community activity uh, post COVID. We also need to um, I think recognise in this business plan two other things which are going on which are really important one of which is continued progress on the local plan um, which uh, is highlighted and also on the uh, implementation of the zero carbon and doubling nature strategies um, which need to be obviously read alongside this report but this year it will be um, a, a, an important year for sort of translating those into action and that is highlighted in some of the key areas of the business. Plan. So that's basically all of the, the comments. I think it's a, another um, program which um, is uh, focused on important areas of delivery to sort of build on the base of the performance of this year, which we've uh, which we've just reviewed in the previous item. So thank, thank you very much indeed. Yeah, and I, I just love the way this is set out, and I love the way that you know you can see at a glance, you know, what's been achieved but also you know what we're aiming to achieve in the uh, in the next next uh, few years so uh, yeah really great really you know, plain english 
and uh, a very readable document. Uh, Councillor van der Weyer. Yes. Uh, thank you, yes. Um, so this is a really great business plan. Uh, plans for the council for the next year and, and well beyond uh, and is even more fantastic um, given that uh, we've, we've the, the year that we've just been through so uh, to have something uh, a realistic plan like this um, at, at this stage um, is, is really impressive uh, and as um, Councillor Scott has said it, it is um, it, there's a lot of continuity with what we've been talking about for the last um, three years um, but also some uh, adaptations to um, the circumstances we, we find ourselves in um, so uh, yes I do hope we can, we can support this thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, would any members of cabinet like to speak on this? No, everyone's happy. That's lovely. Good. Uh, Councillor De Lacey. Thank you very much, Leader. Um, I know that you have received a heartfelt plea from Panther Taxis about the way in which under our current planning, some taxi drivers are dealt with. And I know that Councillor Macdonald has explained that we have followed our procedures and that he approves. I understand all of that. But I wonder, Leader, whether we might revisit these procedures in the light of Mr Clare's concerns. Other authorities have taken a different view. And I should add that Mr Clare is the son of a friend of mine, but I believe his appeal stands on its own merits. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. So I've also had, uh, I responded to a letter from uh, the uh, MP for Cambridge City, uh, Daniel Zeichner, on this matter and uh, you know, sent him a very detailed explanation which had been provided for me and Councillor Macdonald by, uh, by our, the head of our business support team. And, we, and Daniel Zeichner is, is, came back to me and said that he was satisfied with the response. But I'm going to come to Councillor Macdonald um, for a, a greater explanation on this. Thank, um, thank, thank you, Leader, and thank you, Dr De Lacey, for, for your question. Um, we did think uh, long and hard about this, and uh, actually we continue to think about it. Um, currently, from the uh, the so-called ARG grants, which contain an element of uh, uh, discretionary decision making, um, we have allocated something like 75% uh, of, of uh, that fund so far. That That's one of the highest deployments actually in the country. And, and Dr De Lacey probably knows Currently, we're paying between 60 and 70 businesses per week. So in the current pandemic or, or in the phase of, of recovery, we are trying to um, deploy those funds as widely and quickly as possible. Um, and we considered that a 10 percent allocation of that fund towards um, uh, individual taxi drivers what was a fair allocation. If we change the rule to um, some of the neighbouring authorities, it would be something like 17%, which we felt was a little bit high for that sector. But but I do take on board his request. Uh, we will look at it again. The fund uh, continues until the end of, of June. Um, and, and thank you for his interest. Thank you. Thank you. Thank very, you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Um, any more questions on this item? OK, so um, we'll move to the recommendations. Um, so members, the recommendations have been moved and seconded. The recommendation is set out in paragraphs five and six of the report. Um, A says consider the proposed 2020 to 25 business plan at Appendix A with the action plan primarily focused on delivery 21 to 22 and recommend it to Council for approval with any amendments as required and B authorise the Chief Executive to make any minor wording changes required to final drafts in consultation with the Deputy Leader. So do members agree with the proposal? Agreed. Agreed. Anybody wish to vote against? And anyone wish to abstain? OK, so Cabinet therefore agrees the proposals by affirmation. Thank you very much. And moving on to item 12 at page 81, uh, which is new town naming. Because we don't do this, this too often, do we? So that's quite exciting. Uh, so Councillor Bill Handley is going to present this and Councillor Toomey Hawkins is going to second it. So over to you, Councillor Handley. Thank you, Leader. Uh, yes, it, indeed, it's the time to look at uh, the consultation uh, on the name of the new town. Um, developers are currently approaching uh, the submission of their first residential planning application. So it's, it's absolutely vital that the new town is given a name and one that's strong and, and supported locally. Uh, the idea is that this should be, excuse me, this should be resolved 
um, prior to the first scheme being approved, which will be midsummer, so that the house builder can sort of promote and deliver their scheme using the new name. Um, uh, engagement with the local members and the parish council have uh, shown that there is support for the principle of this process locally. So um, it's recommended that Cabinet note the contents of the report uh, and agree the engagement process that the two master developers are going to follow and they're, and they're given at uh, paragraphs 11 and 12. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Jimmy Hawkins, do you want to come in at this point? Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Leader. Um, as we know, when a new member is on the way in the family, the process of selecting a name is a collaborative one. Uh, sometimes in the nuclear family, sometimes in the wider family. And it's an important task, obviously, because the name uh, identifies or sets the identity of the person. Names matter a lot. And so naming this new community in a district, um, you know, in the way that has been um, proposed, uh, is a good one. And I'm firmly of the view that uh, we should support this proposal and uh, take this naming process forward as has been um, identified. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. So I think we have um, representatives from from the um, the two uh, bodies involved, Urban and Civic and RLW Estates. Um, I can see Sam Fulder Hughes there. So should we start uh, representing RLW Estates? So should we start? Should we start off with Sam, and um, then we'll see if we've got anybody else as well. Hello, Sam. Welcome. Hello. Thank you very much, Councillor Smith. I thought uh, Councillor Hawkins put uh, you know, the sort of substance of what we're trying to put across to you today very well. Um, we all recognise the importance of names to give places and their residents a sense of identity, culture and cohesion. Uh, most places in Cambridge have names that are embedded in history and naming new places, of course, has a bit of a mixed history, which is why we've been working collaboratively and with SCDC colleagues to develop this uh, robust process. Uh, drawn from and shaped by community governance processes and we're here today to ensure that this has your approval as a process in advance of bringing back the recommendation um, after the naming process has been completed. Um, one of the things that we're quite keen to stress in terms of how we design the consultation is the importance of recognising Cambridge's history but also recognising the residents who live there today and their and their view on what the new town should be called and um, but also we've got um we've we've been very keen to stress as well that we want to engage with young people and um, we're going to be engaging with uh, the youth uh, parish council and with other youth groups to ensure that we've got an idea of what the sort of future residents of the new town might like and, and what they and how they might engage with uh, their new homes and um, that was all i had to say i don't know if rebecca's had a chance to join yet uh, thank you, thank you very much, Sam. And uh, and I really I really like the brochure that you put together. It looks it looks great. Um, but I do appreciate you know trying to please all of the people all of the time is uh, is going to be is going to be tough. So we're, we will aim for most of them. Hello, Rebecca. I can see uh, see you you've joined us on behalf of Urban and Civit. Would you like to speak now? Yes, please. Uh, thank you. Sorry for being slightly late joining. Yeah, I think it's absolutely the case that we are very conscious that throughout all of the consultation that we've been doing over recent years. Um, there's been a lot of discussion uh, which has broadly come under the planning term of Water Beach Newtown um, and this does seem an opportunity in which we can just pause for a moment uh, and allow people to uh, to think fully about the name itself. We know name is such an integral part of people's identity uh, and, and the cultural uh, connections that people have. And what we've been working through with this process is something that follows the community governance structure that we will be uh, working with yourselves on going forwards. And critically, what we think with the process is we've got that ability to have a really broad range of discussion as part of the consultation, but also then to have some specific stakeholder uh, discussions which pick up some of the more sensitive areas particularly around heritage and ensuring that, uh, you know, we've got memorial gardens there, we've got uh, huge amounts of uh, emotion from, from veterans and other groups there, as well as going back to Roman times and, and medieval times. Uh, we've obviously got a lot of interest in uh, the planning process and in the future governance from the existing villages around, uh, particularly from, from Water Beach and a community governance uh, aspect in place on that. 
And we're also very keen through the workshops to bring in the voice of young people and try and ensure we have that full arc of Water Beach as a place, a robust name for it going forward uh, as, a, as a future part of South Cambridgeshire's communities. Um, so we feel this process has that option of being able to do a wide scope, to do specific thinking uh, with uh, stakeholder groups and then to come forward with a recommendation. And, and we're certainly keen to, to make sure that uh, that you yourselves are uh, kind of comfortable with the process uh, and comfortable with your role in future uh, rec agreeing to the recommendation that comes through. Uh, thank, thank you, Rebecca. So I see Caroline Foster's also joined us from Urban and Civic. Caroline, do you want to add anything? No, not at all. Thank you. Thank you. I think um, Rebecca has summed it up. Um, we're excited to get started, really. This is a, a key moment for us in uh, progressing the development. And I think the work we've done with RRW and Seth Cameron's to date on this has created a, a robust process that I'm confident we can take forward in the right way. Excellent. OK, thank you. So, you know, we must never underestimate how important these names are to people. Yeah, it really, really matters. And um, what I always say to developers is every extra minute that you can uh, you can spend on co consultation will will pay huge dividends further down the line. So I'm very reassured that you're, you're you know you are going to be very inclusive. I hope when you're talking about young people, you are talking about young people from the very young to the uh, you know to young to young adult um, because they're not not all groups of young people are you know, are easy to to engage with, but there are ways of. There are ways of doing it. I always found the teenagers offer them pizza and um, they'll, they'll engage with you. So I recommend the pizza. Uh, so that, <laughs> jolly good. So uh, any cabinet members wish to speak at this point? No. And any other members present wish to add anything? OK, so we'll move on to the recommendation. Uh, cabinet's recommended uh, to note the contents of this report, agree with the engagement process that the two master developers will follow, uh, paragraphs 11 and 12, to gather feedback and opinion on the name of the new town north of Water Beach. Cabinet's asked to agree the final step in the process, whereby Cabinet are required to take the final decision on the name of the new town following the period of engagement. Uh, so do members agree with the proposal? Agreed. Agreed. Sound a bit more Agreed. cheerful, Brian. <laughs> uh, does anyone wish to vote against the proposal? No. And does anyone wish to abstain? Lovely. So Cabinet therefore agrees the proposal by affirmation. And thank you very much um, for your participation, um, Sam, Rebecca and Caroline. OK, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're very welcome. Uh, so moving on now to uh, item 13 at page 103, which is the 2020-21 revenue and capital budget monitoring. And John Williams is going to present this and Councillor Peter MacDonald is going to second it. So uh, starting with John Williams, please. Thank you, Leader. Uh, I present to you the uh, Revenue and Capital Budget Monitoring Report for the third quarter of this current financial year. Uh, that is from the period from October to the end of December 2020 and propose the recommendation set out in paragraph three. This includes the uh, housing revenue account. The report pretty much speaks for itself. As we anticipated, our income would be negatively impacted by uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and that it would also cause us additional costs. Also, the pandemic has negatively impacted on some schemes that we were to, br were to bring us savings and also the capital programme. Nevertheless, overall, the impact has been less than it could have been. The government has supported the council with its increased costs, although it has been slow in compensating us for our loss in income. And I refer you to paragraph nine. Our commercial strategy and income has been affected, and I will, would refer you to the appendices for details of this. Interest uh, from Urban Street loans has been lower than expected, but generally speaking, income from commercial rents has held up. We expect this to improve. We are also seeing matters improving in planning with the recouping of outstanding fees from pre-planning application support uh, for strategic sites. Finally, I must thank the hardworking business and finance teams for distributing the government grants to local businesses. Uh, see paragraph 15. Uh, Councillor MacDonald will elaborate further on this. 
because of COVID-19, the three months before last Christmas was a challenging time uh, and it is a credit to all our staff that the negative impact mm. has been contained so that we go into the new financial year in a better place than most other councils. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Councillor MacDonald. Um, thank you. Thank you, Leader. So, um, uh, as we mentioned briefly before in response to uh, uh, Councillor Dr De Lacey, uh, I'm pleased to say and wish to thank um, both the officers um, within the Council who have done an absolutely amazing job, both in the, in the first round of grants of, of 25 million plus uh, received from government last year and then subsequently uh, November until now during lockdown three. Um, uh, uh, last Friday we passed a figure of 10 million which has been deployed to South Cam's businesses and, and as we previously mentioned a uh, significant part of this are discretionary grants um, which are administered, administered in a very manual and time consuming way but nevertheless we have already allocated 75% of the funds that the government identified for us based on our population. So I'd like to thank officers again. I'd also like to thank members uh, because they've done a sterling job in helping us to reach businesses and make sure that this money is uh, reaching uh, businesses, especially SMEs. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, so yes, I, I echo Councillor McDonald's um, thanks to um, to the, the business support team, but actually my thanks to him also, because uh, you know he has done such a huge amount to um, to steer a steady ship on on the business grants. Um, but also huge credit to Councillor John Williams, who uh, you know without John um, and Peter Maddox fantastic team you know we would potentially be in the sort of mess that many 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 other councils are but due to the uh, the diligence the hard work and the considerable expertise of councillor williams and of peter maddox and and all his staff you know we find ourselves in a good position nowadays um, which really most councils cannot cannot say as they come as we start to come out of the pandemic so um yeah, and I don't. Yeah, I, yeah. Just thank, thank you to everybody. Uh, so, are there any any questions, please, from other cabinet members? No. Uh, so, I have Councillor Heather Williams. Thank you, Leader. Um, I've got a couple of questions. One is on page hundred and eight. Um, we've got some. I understand, obviously, the finance and and probably corporate services, given everything that's going on. Um, has gone above. I just wanted to um, check about planning and whether the future budget has taken into consideration that and will will we be more on track with our with our budget for planning. Um, I'd also say that I know their percentages um, but 511% uh, seems quite quite a substantial um, amount um, even though it's obviously not not as drastic as 511% seems. Um, so I'm just wondering oh, if um, um, I will. Oh, sorry. If, <laughs> sorry. Um, I think it's OK. Councillor Bradnam, could you mute, please? My apologies. Do do continue, Councillor Williams. <laughs> no worries. So just uh, just some reassurances um, that that everything will be OK with that and all on track, even though it's an, an underspend. And then page 113, it's Point seven on the business and growth. Um, obviously, on the RAG rating, the investment strategy is is slightly behind, um, and obviously, there's been changes and things with the recent announcements on MHCLG and uh, the PWLB. So, I just want some want to, to see if the lead member has some reassurance for us, given how reliant we are on growth to to fund that uh, near six million. Shortfall. I think from recollection, it's just over four million that we're intending to get from business and growth. So um, what are we doing to get that back on track as a council? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Uh, Councillor Williams, do you want to address the, the first point, which was about the planning service, or do you want me to bring in um, Stephen Kelly? Well, on, on the planning service, I think if you look at um, appendix, um, I think it's one, uh, the C C1 um, is an explanation there 
as to the uh, the planning um, deficit. Um, my understanding is that planning is working to um, resolve that particular issue, and that the um, that next year's budget does take account of um, the changing circumstances in planning. Um, and I would also like to add that, of course, the loss in income from planning has been made up by the government. Um, although, as I said, um, the government's been a bit slow in paying us uh, for that loss of income. We've had um, the government uh, split the financial year into thirds. So the first four months we've received, uh, that's from that's from March through to July, we've received that money, but we're still outstanding um, um, August to November. Um, that's over £700,000 of lost income that the government has yet to compensate us for. So, and of course, we haven't put the bid in yet for the for the last four months, because obviously we haven't come to the end of the financial year. Um, but given that, you know, if the government, um, you know, is true to its promise, um, then um, we're, we're hopeful that we will um, see an improvement um, and we are expecting, um, you know, planning to be on budget next financial year. So uh, could I, can I just bring in uh, Stephen Kelly if he wants to add anything before, and then we'll come back to the second question, which was about the investment strategy. Uh, thank you. Um, yes, we are, we are um, obviously doing some work uh, on uh, potential forecasts because because clearly the planning service is a net cost and it's contingent upon fee income, which is contingent upon the number of applications that we receive. So we are doing some scenario modelling around what we think might happen to planning application numbers by different types to help us to uh, think about any adjustments that we that we may well need. But clearly our commitment is to try and sit within our budget envelope that's defined by the council uh, and um, once we've concluded that work looking at the um, potential implications and indeed what our options are for responding to that uh, I'm sure we'll uh, we'll come back further if necessary but at the moment Councillor Williams is is right in that the service uh, is taking advantage of the income compensation scheme from uh, the government uh, and um, obviously we'll be putting its submissions in uh, around that to seek to uh, at least recover some of the lost income that, that arises from uh, the effects of COVID. Uh, thank you. It's not helpful when they work to thirds, is it? Um, uh, Councillor Williams, did you want to comment on the variance of 511% um, as well before coming on to talk about the uh, the investment strategy? Um, well, that, that's also explained within the appendices, but um, I may be, um, Peter Campbell may be able to uh, give some more detail on, on it. Thank you, Peter. Are you there? I am here, but I, I thought I thought that was a planning question. What, what we took, what page are we on, please? So this was the uh, on page 108, the table there which shows the variances, and it's showing um, the Housing General Fund. It's showing a variance of minus 511%, um, and. Do you, do you mind if I come in? Uh, yes, Chair? that's lovely. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Liz. You. So, so I think Councillor Heather Williams has pointed out that you know when when you you have small numbers, the percentage differences can be very large. Uh, so, so, and we've kind of talked long and hard with Cabinet about how we how we present this data, um, and you know there are obviously pros and cons in terms of presenting the variances as percentages. That this is one of the areas where. You know, it's definitely not helpful to us to look like a massive variance on actually a, a relatively small amount of money. And, um, you know, I think that's just one of the things that we need to live with if we're going to continue to present variances as percentages. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so, Councillor Williams, uh, John Williams, uh, coming back to um, Councillor Heather Williams' question about um, investments and the impact on investments. Yes, well, um, as we discussed at full council when we discussed this coming year's uh, budget. Uh, we have taken into account the changes to the Public Works Loan Board uh, rules and which obviously does impact on us because um, we are no longer able to um, purchase um, properties for purely for yield, uh, for commercial yield. Nevertheless, 
Um, we do have um, other um, in the pipeline. We do we do have through our partnerships. Um, we do have other um, um, proposals uh, for for increasing our um, our income, um, while at the same time obviously delivering place making uh, and affordable homes. Uh, but all that has been taken into account in next year's budget and in the medium term financial strategy going forward. So um, yes, we've 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 had to make a change, but nevertheless, our uh, commercial strategy is still sound and uh, we will be coming forward um, in the new financial year with further schemes um, to enable us to uh, meet the um, anticipated income from those from that from our commercial investments. Thank, thank you. So I wonder if I could just ask you to just give some clarity um, about the, the you know what our current um, investments amount to because obviously we inherited was it two hundred and six million pounds debt for the council housing, and then um, obviously there was borrowing associated with Ermine Street, um, and then can, we can we've obviously you there, leader. Yeah. We, we haven't actually borrowed any money for Ermine Street. Fine. Would you um, like to Ermine clarify Street the, the situation, please? From our reserves. I think there is a yes, there is there is a, a misunderstanding here that um, there is an assumption that if we buy something, we've borrowed money for it. And in fact, so far, we haven't had to borrow money. We will be borrowing money in the net in the new financial year um, to um, to purchase um, things. But at the moment, um, we've uh, the only long term borrowing we have outstanding is that 206 million uh, that was taken out by the previous administration in order for us to retain our council rents. And that is at the moment the only long term borrowing that we have. All the commercial um, uh, purchases that we've made over the last um, year um, have come from our reserves and we have not had to borrow to purchase those properties. That that's really that's very helpful as a point of clarification. And my understanding is that any you know the the plans for future borrowing are going to be you know reasonably reasonably modest in the in the future as well. Uh, ab absolutely yes, and and you will see from the MTFS that we have um, adjusted our um, expectation of our, of our about borrowing going forward over the next five years. That's that's lovely. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. OK, um, so I see Councillor Williams would like to come back with a further question. That's fine. Thank you. Um, it was just on what was referenced. I, I didn't reference about borrowing for commercial, I just said with the changes that have been made um, to clarify my question. But um, the League Member for Finance says we haven't borrowed at all. Um, could he could he explain then uh, audit and corporate governance? We were told about thirty nine million pound that was going to be borrowed because my understanding is we managed to get in before the public works loan changed. That was what was reported to us, but things might have changed after that meeting. Can I have some clarification around 39 million, please? Um, we have short term borrowing to help our cash flow, but we haven't borrowed money to purchase our commercial investments, but we will need to be doing that uh, with the um, with the current um, commercial investment that we are, um, you know, will be undertaking going forward. But at the moment, as you know, because this has been, all these commercial investments have been discussed at scrutiny. Um, we have not had to borrow money for them because we've had sufficient reserves to, to, to use. Thank, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. I don't know if. Um, if Peter Maddox wanted to come in and add anything there, I think John's probably uh, given sufficient explanation. Yep. OK, we, well, just to confirm, yeah, we, we borrowed 39 million short term. That's the just short term. Yeah, yeah. but for, to help our cash flow. Yeah. That's that's lovely. And I know that councils, but councils borrow short term all the time and they quite often borrow from each other, don't they? So. Um, mm. 
Okie doke. Uh, so if there aren't any more questions, we will move to the recommendations. Um, so Cabinet is recommended to A, acknowledge the forecast 2020-21 revenue position against the approved revenue budget shown in Appendix B, the projected major variances with reasons for these variances at Appendices C1 and C2 and with the action being taken to address the underlying issues and B, acknowledge the latest capital programme 2020-21 position and variances, if any, as shown in Appendix D. So do members agree with the proposal? Agreed. 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 Thank you. Anyone wish to vote against? And anyone wish to abstain? Thank you. So Cabinet therefore agrees the proposals by affirmation. And moving on to 14 at page 127. Uh, this is the Home Link Allocation Policy and Councillor Hazel Smith will be presenting this and it will be seconded by Councillor Toomey Hawkins. So over to Hazel. Thank you, Leader. Um, well, just by way of introduction, I think most members will be aware that Homelink covers 34 affordable housing providers in Cambridgeshire and West Suffolk. It's a web based system that we and partner councils and housing associations in these areas use to allocate affordable homes in a fair way to applicants from our housing registers. We in South Camps have taken the lead in this review. And I would like to thank our officers, especially Heather Wood, for conducting the review of this home link policy for our partners in the sub region. As the report says, the policy has been subject to updating for new guidance. It's been a, a line by line um, check and has been out for consultation to our partners and their populations. All the comments have been taken into account and agreed across the area by the home link board and the policy is now coming to us for formal adoption in South Camps by the Cabinet as the final stage in this process. Um, you'll see in paragraph 16 of the report that the solicitor who Heather consulted said, in my view, this is a good and detailed allocation policy. It is clear and comprehensive and in my view, it will enable applicants to understand how their application has been ass assessed. So I'd like to thank Heather very much for her excellent work on this and her team. And I know it's been a time consuming undertaking and much appreciated by ourselves and our partners. Um, if there are any questions, I'll have to hand over to Heather, who knows it all very well. Um, and I think Heather has a few, few slides which she'd like to show, which um, show how this um, helps to um, to get people into new homes. Um, both across the areas and in South Cams. That would that would be lovely. Thank you, Heather. Are you ready to um, share your screen? Thank you very much. Can you all see that? Uh, it's, hang on, something's happening. Yes, yep. can see it now. You're quite quiet though, so turn oh, your volume okay. up. Okay, I please. see if I can turn. Is that better? Yes, yes, that's fine. Good. Thank you. Gladly. OK, so thank you. I shared some slides with Councillor Hazel Smith and we thought that they might be interesting for you all to see. And there's a dual purpose in bringing them to you. So firstly, I'm hoping they will offer reassurance to you that the policy works um, and is able to be responsive to a range of different housing circumstances. And the second reason for bringing it is really, again, to offer reassurance about the policy of the team and how they have been able to um, keep the service going, but actually exceed the number of allocations to social housing that they've done during the pandemic. And I thought that both of those would be of interest to this meeting. So I will just quickly show you some of the sub-regional information before looking more locally. Um, so sub-regionally, you may just be interested to note that there are over 10,000 households registered for ho social housing. 58% of those are actually in work, which I find very interesting given the perceptions that often people searching for social housing, there's a perception that they people don't work on things. So I find that interesting. I and mean, it's something we may want to keep an eye on as the pandemic impacts deepen to see how it changes the makeup of who's on our register. Um, <clears throat> I've put some information there about the number of households who were housed across the subregion from Band A for homelessness and Band B for homeless uh, prevention. It's actually very interesting, I think, to <clears throat> share with you that although we are responsive to homelessness and homeless prevention, that isn't the only reason that people are being housed. And I think it's really important that an allocations policy can respond flexibly to a range of different circumstances. 
So for example, we'll house people because of medical needs and health and safety needs as well. So what those figures just show is that whilst we are very responsive to homeless situations, it's not the only reason. So those figures make up a percentage of our allocations, but they're not the only reason we house people. I've also added that um, 357 people across the subregion were housed as a result of domestic abuse or, or other forms of harassment. And again, I've put that in for information because the domestic abuse bill is currently going through um, its course and we will need to start working in a different way and change some of our services a little bit within housing and allocations and homeless prevention to be responsive to that. So I just thought that might just be a general um, information point. The one that's really useful to draw your attention to is that in the first 11 months of this year, um, across the partnership, we'd allocated 2,666 properties. As a comparison, last year, when we weren't, sorry, the, the year before we hit the pandemic, we'd, off, we'd allocated 2,963. So what that shows is 11 months in, we're pretty much on target to allocate the same number of properties as we had pre-pandemic. So it shows that the allocation system has been able to keep going. And, and again, I'll pick that up at a local level. So there's a statistic on there or a figure on there. 11 months in, in South Cams, we've allocated 466 properties. The, when we weren't in the pandemic, in the whole 12 months, we'd allocated 442. So actually what we've done in a pandemic in 11 months is allocated more social housing than we did prior to the pandemic. And that's actually no mean achievement because um, in the first quarter, everything slowed down and virtually stopped. So we weren't allocating very much at all. It's a team of four people. And for some of that time, we were an officer down. So those officers have worked incredibly hard to maintain the, the allocation service during the pandemic. And I'm really proud of that. And I know across the organisation, we've had huge amounts of staff who've just gone over and above to keep the services going. But this is just another example of that that I wanted to highlight for you. Um, and again, I've just put a little bit of information on there for information. So you can see that in, you know, we housed most people from band A and B, which is what you would expect. So 344 of our 466 households that were housed came from the highest need band. That is what you would expect because we want to be responding as flexibly as possible to those most in need. And again, I've just put the homelessness prevention and homeless um, ha ha accommodation figures up there. So you can see that 185 of our allocations have been to people who are homeless or at risk of homelessness. So it forms a high proportion of what we do, but it's not the only reason we house people. And that's really important, just as I was saying, to show that the system can be responsive to a range of circumstances. So I thank you for allowing me to share these stats. I hope I've offered you reassurance about how the policy works and also demonstrated how well the team have been able to keep the service going in a pandemic. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Have Thank I managed you. to do that? Yeah, exactly. you have. Yeah, you have. Heather, I'm blown away by what you've just shown us. It's just brilliant, absolutely brilliant. And uh, my huge thanks to you Thank and you. all your team. I can't believe you've done more allocations during COVID. I wasn't I wasn't expecting that at all. So you know, talk about bucking the trend. Absolutely brilliant. I'd really like those slides to be shared with all members, please. Um, I think they'd all they'd all appreciate them. And I think I'd also like you to send them to uh, Tom in our comms team, because I think there's uh, I think there's something we can do. We can do on that as well. And, and the very fact that you are a team of four, uh, you know, four seems to be the magic number actually on on teams uh, within South Cams. But uh, just just brilliant. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Councillor Hawkins, uh, I think you want to second this. Uh, thank you, Lida. Yes, um, I'm not sure there's much more I can say after that, really, uh, except to say that the process that, um, you know, uh, we have, as we've seen from the numbers, um, works very well and the tweaks that have been made can only make that better. And, you know, to echo your thanks to the team of four who have done such a great job, um, you know, in the last um, last 11 months. I mean, 466 households are looking at properties higher than the previous year. And of those, about three quarters were in the highest needs bands. Um, absolutely brilliant. So I support this and recommend it to, uh, to Cabinet. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and, you know, the, the you know, one of those shock statistics is that 58 percent 
of people you know, in need of social housing are in work and that reflects the unaffordability of, yeah. of our area. That you can be you can be in a job and you can be in a good job and you still can't afford to, to live here. And that's that's one of the biggest challenges that we are facing moving forward. Uh, so any more any questions from members of cabinet? Yes. That, oh, thank you. Yes, you've raised your hand. You haven't put in the in the um, in the chat. Councillor Mills. Yeah, I, I'd just like to uh, reinforce uh, the commendations to the team for um, their performance. I, I, I found, find that recovery figure uh, absolutely astonishing um, f from uh, not being able to do anything almost in uh, the COVID period. And I think um, I know Kaminus and, and other members don't need any reminding of the level of importance uh, to the people who are making these applications. You know, this is critical stuff in their lives. Um, and if uh, if we can continue uh, having this level of responsiveness uh, to their needs, I think it uh, speaks well for all of us. And absolutely wow, thank you to Heather and the other uh, members of the team for, for doing that. I know from my own casework how important this is and uh, let's continue in the same direction. Thank you. That, thank you. Yes, and I'd like I'd like um, our comms team to pick up on that 58 percent, um, but also on what you've told us about. You know, this isn't just about meeting up, addressing homelessness. Um, you mentioned uh, domestic abuse. I spoke a uh, week and a half ago at the public policy forum um, in Westminster on uh, on domestic abuse. And I must, that was a sort of half day conference and some of it made very, very difficult, difficult listening, quite honestly. Um, and this is a problem that is going to that is going to put more and more of a burden on services such as such as ours. Now that we, there's going to be there's going to be the new duty on us to uh, provide housing. So thank you. Uh, so a nice comment from Councillor Bill, Bill Handley in the in the chat saying brilliant work. Thank you to uh, Heather and her team. Any questions from any non cabinet members? Uh, Leader. Yes. Sorry, Heather had her hand up earlier. Um, thank you. Thank you. I, thank you. I just wanted to um, say that the comms team have actually got a press release ready to go today oh, that's brilliant. highlighted how we've performed and the uh, and the overall stats. So I, I hope that that will be um, good. We've tried to reflect how well we think we've done as a council. Um, and thank you for your lovely comments about the allocation service. I will send those back to them. But I also just must highlight that we have a partnership manager and we host that post here within South Cams and that partnership manager is a lady called Sharon Locke and actually she should have a huge amount of credit for actually leading the day to day review. So I just wanted to make sure that was acknowledged. So thank you very much. I really appreciate your feedback on it. That's lovely. So can we minute um, our thanks to Sharon Locke as well, please, Nat um, and to Heather. I know you'll pass it on. Uh, so we are, where are we? Um, so the recommendation is that Cabinet are asked to note the outcome of the allocations review, including the consultation and feedback, and agree the subsequent revisions to the Lettings policies. Uh, so is Cabinet, um, oh gosh, slightly confused with this. Uh, so do members agree with that, with the uh, recommendations, please? Agree. Thank you. Anyone agree. wish to, thank you. Anyone wish, wish to vote against? And anyone wish to abstain? Uh, thank you. So Cabinet therefore agrees the uh, recommendations by affirmation. So moving on to item 16, which is Ermine Street, uh, Ermine Street Housing Business Plan. Now there is um, confidential information in the part two appendix. If any member wishes to discuss anything within that appendix, then we will have to move into closed session but if they if there's nothing in that appendix that needs to be discussed uh then we can stay in in open session uh could you please if, does it, if anybody wants to discuss anything in in the part two appendix could they please indicate now no? okay in that in that case we will stay in open session and um, this item is going to be presented by Councillor Hazel Smith and is going to be seconded by Councillor John Williams. Over to you, Hazel. Thank you very much, Leader. Well, um, yes, Ermine Street Business Plan. Um, the Ermine Street Business Plan um, 
comes before you as it does every year. Um, Owen Street is our market rental housing company and it has a review um, every year at this time. This report, as, it, as you'll see, was, was um, written in December 2020. Um, so there, there are some updates. Um, Owen Street is now seen within the council as a close partner to our housing department rather than just an investment vehicle, which was the way it was set up. It now concentrates on acquiring stock for rental within the investment area, which is the Greater Cambridge Commuting Area, as identified in the Cambridgeshire and Peterborough Independent Economic Review sphere, which came out in September 2018. And this does include Peterborough. Recently, they've acquired some houses in Camborne to be used as houses in multiple occupation. And these are let by Shire Homes, our other housing company, uh, for temporary accommodation. And this helps to reduce our need to use bed and breakfast accommodation in the council, um, as, as, Heather was, um, as Heather Williams was uh, talking about earlier. The business plan review gives the company an opportunity to review the trading over the year, adjust the budgets and re-examine the assumptions. The bad debt provision and void loss assumptions have been changed because of the COVID pandemic, which has had an impact on rent arrears and void loss over the past year. Fortunately, in the short term, this will not have an adverse effect on the financial performance of the company. It's anticipated that up to 488 properties will have been acquired by the end of this month. This would leave 12 to be acquired during the remainder of 2021 to achieve the target of 500 properties, which was set in 2015. Any future expansion in the form of additional housing beyond the 500 properties will be subject to further agreement from the council with an agreement about future loan terms and rates. The company's work will benefit the council this year by about £2.9 million in interest payments. The council commissioned an options appraisal report from Savills last year to consider future options once the target of 500 homes has been achieved. The report recommended that the company be allowed to expand to the original target of 500 homes and then the council will take stock and decide on future investment. So as well as buying homes to let, Ermin Street takes Ministry of Defence to homes, typically on, on five-year leases. It improves them if necessary and rents them out. They currently have three lease arrangements in place with the DIO, Defence Infrastructure Organisation, and um, 148 of their dwellings were in the current portfolio being let and managed last December. Um, there are more now. An additional five had been added to the Bassingbourne lease in May 2020, and an additional six were added to the Water Beach portfolio more recently with tenants in situ. There was no upfront investment needed for these, and the lease portfolio continues to make a positive contribution to the business plan. Uh, lease extensions have been agreed at Water Beach and Bassingbourne beyond the first five years, and work is progressing at Brampton to extend the lease there and to take on an additional 36 homes. Upfront investment will be required in these homes because they've been empty for some time. A report taken to the board concluded that even with the upfront investment, the additional 36 would make a positive contribution to the business plan, and this will bring the total leased properties to 190. So they are managing these in addition to the 500 that they're acquiring for us. The head of Ermine Street continues to meet monthly with myself and Councillor John Williams to discuss the acquisition progress, the future strategy and the possibility of future developments with the Council. This December 2020 version of the business plan is to be received by Cabinet and full Council as the sole shareholder in the company and the recommendation is that Cabinet just receives the plan for information. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Councillor Smith. So, so Emma Street's done really well in um, getting you know, just a sort of gnat's whiskers away from its target of uh, of 500 housing houses, and the uh, the 190 leased properties obviously uh, adds considerably to our ability to uh, provide rental properties. 
uh, for, for our residents. I'm really pleased that uh, the company has adapted so well to our instruction to restri restrict their pur purchases to uh, the travel to work area. I'm much more comfortable with that and um, I think uh, I think they've been really successful in in delivering on that. So thank you very much indeed. Uh, Councillor Williams. Sorry, Councillor John Williams, you're muted. You're muted. It's very, it can be very sensitive, can't it? Trying to unmute. You have to. I hope we haven't lost you altogether. Still muted. Can can anybody un, has anybody got the means to unmute Councillor John Williams, please? OK, well, look, tell you what, John, while you you try and get unmuted, uh, we'll see if there are any any questions from anybody. Actually, um, uh, yes. So, uh, Duncan Vesey, do you want would you want to um, just add anything to um, what Councillor Smith has um, has said in her introduction? Uh, yes, thanks, Leader. Thanks for the opportunity. Um, yeah, just to just to give Cabinet um, some more good news um, in that the MOD have ex have accepted the new version um, of the lease for the 36 additional properties and the lease extension in Brampton. Now, this was pretty critical for us because as um, as uh, Councillor Smith said, there was some uh, upfront investment necessary um, in the properties because they've been empty for so long. And, and basically the new lease will protect the company um, should the lease be terminated uh, within the five years or after five years where we've, um, where we've spent a lot of money on new kitchens, um, heating systems, and in some cases rewiring. So the company is protected by by the ability to claw back some of that expenditure. So that's been that's been a success in the past week. That, that's lovely. Well, well, well done on that. And I gather that these MOD properties are very popular with with tenants. Yes, they are. Um, I mean, they're very spacious and uh, with big gardens and yeah, they are very popular. Um, of the 36 that we've um, that we knew we were going to get, but it hasn't been confirmed yet. Um, and we've already let um, 10 of them um, and that's that's in Brampton. Yeah, so the market is very buoyant for, for this type of accommodation, which is good news. That's lovely and Brampton's Brampton's a nice place. So yes, why wouldn't you want to, to live there? So um so John John oh Councillor Williams, oh, hooray, you're, you're back. Okay. Well done. Jolly good. Right. Over to you. Um yeah, I'm I'm very delighted to um to second this because um as you said, leader, um you know, we had a review of Urban Street when we um we took control of the council in uh, 2018 and it was clear that um, if you look at paragraph uh, 12 uh, in the report, that um, Irma Street wasn't actually delivering on its original business plan. It wasn't buying 100 homes a year. It wasn't um, taking up its, um, its full uh, capital allowance. And we made some decisions in um, then, which has actually proved to be the right decisions in that um, we stopped Irma Street being purely a vehicle to make money for the council, which was the previous administration's um, intention, and actually bring it into the, the housing mix um, for the district, for those living and working in the district. And I'm very really pleased that as a result of that, um, we've been, they've been able to purchase properties in the drive to work area, but also um, been much more involved with, for example, providing HMO um, 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 housing to meet um, single persons housing needs and to help um, housing with um, with rehousing homeless um, families. So, you know, we're doing much more with Urban Street now, and I look forward to them being involved with some of our housing developments going forward and continuing with providing good quality open market rented housing for those who live and work in South Cambridgeshire. 
Thank, thank you very much. And uh, as you say, it's very, you know, it's got to be good quality, good quality. Oh dear, so thank you very much indeed. Uh, so Councillor Milnes, your hand is up, is that? Yes, it was, for, it was for this item, uh, Leader. I just wanted to um, say how, how good it's to hear that we're uh, putting empty properties back into use. Uh, through um, in street. I mean, it's a, a blight, uh, the number of empty properties and anything that we can do in that respect is good news. So thank you for that. Thank, thank you very much. Um, and I very much like the way the report is presented. Again, it's very reasonable. It's easy to understand. You know, it's it's, uh, it's yeah, nice, nicely set out. So uh, so well done on that. Uh, so any questions from any other cabinet members? Any questions for anyone else present? Nope. OK, so um, members, uh, the rec oh, where are we? The recommendations. Thank Sorry, you. I'm just struggling to find where the recommendation is. Give me two, two ticks. Uh, OK, so cabinets requested to consider the report and if satisfied to a receive the Ermine Street business plan for the period 2020-21 to 29 to 2030 for information. And uh, yeah, so that's it. Uh, so are members agree with the proposal? Agreed. 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 Do you, anyone wish to vote against? No, and anyone wish to abstain? Thank you. So Cabinet therefore agrees the proposals by affirmation. So at, there's one more item to discuss and at this point we have to um, um, make a decision about the exclusion of press and the public. Uh, so we now come to the point on our agenda where we need to consider whether, well, just said that bit. Uh, this is because the next items contain information which is commercially sensitive. Members of the public are advised that if Cabinet agrees to exclude the press and the public, the video stream will end. I therefore propose that the press and public be excluded from the meeting during consideration of the following item of business in accordance with section 100A brackets 4 of the Local Government Act 1972 on the grounds that, if present, there would be a disclosure to them of exempt information as defined in paragraph 3 of part 1 of schedule 12A of the Act brackets as amended. And I believe Councillor Aidan van der Weyer is going to second that. Yeah. Thank you. Do members agree with the proposal? Agreed. Thank you. Anyone wish to vote against the proposal? And anyone wish to abstain? OK, so Cabinet therefore agrees the proposal by affirmation. Members of the public who are watching this, um, this means the video stream will end now. We thank you for joining us to view today's Cabinet meeting. And so if um, I could be informed when there are no members of the public left in the meeting, please. <laughs>